Speaking of great speakers, Wendy, I want to give you time this morning. Thank you so much for ministering to the women this weekend. So many of them were so deeply touched. Uh, Wendy has books in the foyer. She's an author. She's traveling. She travels more than she can even keep up with. Um, and so we just want to welcome you this morning and bless you. Let's just welcome her here. Thank you so much. receiving an offering. She came and didn't ask for anything, and we just want to bless her this weekend. Thank you. I just love sharing my story, and um, that's even what my books are about. A lot of it just is my journey to freedom. Not that I'm completely free yet, still on the journey, but uh, how many of you know there's always people that you're ahead of? Every one of you. So we all get to lead, we all get to share our part of the journey. And uh, like my journey could be your breakthrough, but what you've come through could be my breakthrough for me. So we need each other really desperately. I thought I'd just start out with a testimony. Um, this is one of my favorites, even though it happened quite a few years ago, because it just speaks so much to me. About four or five years ago, my husband and I, um, attend Bethel Church in Redding, California, and my husband's on staff, so he has interns, which it's the third year program of the Bethel School of Supernatural. And we had this one intern who loved to evangelize. I mean, he lived for it. And he noticed that any time he came up against someone who said they were an atheist, he would subtly kind of back off because he'd never had any success talking to atheists. And so his belief system was, I can't lead atheists to the Lord. And he was in uh, the UK, and he was taking a team from a church out to the park, and they were going to you know, do some witnessing. And he saw a group of about 10 to 13 teenagers, and he walks up and... You know, he's so bold. It's just, hi, I'm from America, and I've got some really great news for you. And the leader of the group was a girl, and she kind of just strutted forward, and she said, because he said, you know, Jesus Christ loves you and has a great plan for your life, and he's trying to talk, but she steps forward and interrupts him and goes, I'm an atheist. But what had happened before that, and this is, cracks me up, is because he, he had been around Steve and I, and we're about belief systems. It's not just about what you do, it's about what you believe. And so he was telling my husband, you know, I, I really struggle with atheists. And Steve said, well, why don't you get a new belief system about that? And he's like, oh, okay. So he thought, okay, I'm gonna start declaring that whenever I'm around an atheist, God always shows up. So he starts declaring that in his head. He starts picturing any time he's around an atheist, God always shows up. So he's in the UK, this girl struts forward and says, I'm an atheist, and he goes, oh, really, that's so exciting. <laughs> and she got kind of a look on her face because that's not usually the result <laughs> that Christians give her. And she's go, she goes, why? And he goes, because God always shows up when I'm around an atheist. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he says, would you like to feel him? And I don't know if they were just humoring him or what, but all of them go, sure, yeah. And they get in this big circle and he goes, okay. Just close your eyes, put out your hands, and repeat after me. Holy Spirit, come. <laughs> and the atheist girl starts crying and shaking and feeling the presence of God. All of them got saved. <laughs> and another group that was out witnessing that day had gotten some young people saved too. And a couple months later, the pastor in that area emailed my husband and said, that day in the park rocked our school. It's never been the same. 
And the reason I love that story isn't just because a bunch of teenagers got saved, that's great, but I love the fact that it, you know, because a lot of us think, well, I'm not very, you know, good at talking to atheists, maybe I need to take another evangelistic class. And sometimes it's not about more education. It's not about what you're doing, it's about what you're believing. Mm -hmm. Because faith is the power behind what you do. He didn't change his method. All he did was change what he believed. It got me to thinking, how many times are we doing things without believing anything will happen? I was sharing yesterday, I struggled with evangelism. I was like, how come I'm not motivated? You know, in my heart, I want people to be saved, but there's this part of me that doesn't like to go out and get people saved. I don't like talking to people. And I tried to just, you know, well, it's because of my personality. I'm an introvert and I'm shy and I don't like to talk. And then God said, no, that's not the reason. The real reason is you don't believe anybody wants to get saved. You ever thought about it? There's no motivation for that. You know, nobody gets up and says, let's go, you know, pray for the lost and see nothing happen. Let's go pray for the sick and see nothing happen. If you don't really believe anything's going to happen, you won't be made motivated to do it. What, what would happen if we spent a few months just dreaming with God that we actually carry something that draws people to Him? You know, my husband and I are really big on declarations because... The more you speak something, the more it changes your belief system. So we have some really wild declarations. And believe it or not, they're working. One of them is, it's impossible for people not to be ministered to when I'm around them. It's impossible for nothing to happen when I pray. And one of the most life-changing uh, declarations I started, I started by accident because my husband and I, we travel a lot, and one day we were in the car, and we were just going over all of our declarations together and proclaiming things that Jesus has told us. And one of them is that we have favor with both God and man. And so I said that out loud, and all of a sudden, before I even thought about it, out of my mouth, I said, we have so much favor, even if we tried to get people to dislike us, we couldn't. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? Is that even legal? <laughs> and so I'm kind of questioning God, and he goes, no, I wanted you to say that, because I wanted you to understand that favor is not just from performance. There is a spirit of favor. Just like some people have a spirit of rejection on them. Have you ever met people, you don't like them, and you don't even know them? And I have used that so many times. Because when you're up in front of a lot of people, sometimes it can get intimidating. I mean, I'm used to speaking to groups, but there was one time that there was, um, we were invited, I don't, do you guys know who Wes and Stacy Campbell are? Back in the 90s, they were really big um, in the prophetic movement and had a really huge influence on me. And so they invited us to their church to minister. And I'm so excited. It's like, oh, these are heroes of the faith to me. And I feel so honored. I get to go speak in their church. And I'm all excited until Sunday morning comes around. And I'm sitting next to Wes and Stacy Campbell. And I think, oh, I have to speak in front of Wes and Stacy Campbell. <laughs> And how many of you know when you, you know, really honor and, and value someone, it can be intimidating to get up and speak. And so I was starting to get tense, that old performance thing was trying to come back on me, and all of a sudden that declaration, even if I tried to get people to dislike me, I couldn't. All of a sudden I was at peace. I don't have to strive. If God wants them to like me, I will. 
we need to have certain belief systems that begin to diffuse old emotional habit patterns in our life, like fear and intimidation. We need to have a phrase that's ready to come to diffuse the things that are keeping us from our destiny. What is it you're afraid of? What's the truth? You know, you can always tell what voice is really speaking in your head by the emotion it leaves in your body and in your emotions. You know, I have a really good friend when we were pastoring in Weaverville, California. It's up in the mountains. It's kind of like this. And she's a real country girl, um, loves hiking and fishing and, you know, the whole bit. And so I would go on hikes with her in the woods. And she would say things like, oh, wow, a bear's been by here. See that footprint? And then see a little scat, or you, know, you guys know what that is, right? City people don't. I have to be aware <laughs> where I am. And she'd go, oh, a deer has been by. And she would know what has been through the area just by what it left. And when she was doing that, I got this thought, you know, that's exactly how you can tell what voice has been speaking to you by what it has left. If guilt, condemnation, feeling overwhelmed, feeling unworthy, feeling like you want to quit, then you're listening to the wrong voice because God's voice never leaves that kind of track. Because He is the God of all hope. He is the God who came to give you life and that life more abundantly. And anything that drains the life out of you, that makes you more tired and want to back away from life instead of stepping out and saying, here I am, is not God. I don't care if it's quoting scripture at you. You know, the scripture can kill as easily as it can bring life. It just... There's a reason why Ephesians 6 says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because anytime you use the Word of God apart from the Spirit of God, you can kill someone. Not where I meant to go. <laughs> talk a little bit about where I think the body of Christ is going. I love the word apocalypse. Everybody knows, you know, that's the Greek word for the English word revelation. We get the book of revelation. It's really the book of the apocalypse. And uh, because of the season that I got saved in, Anytime I heard the word apocalypse, I always pictured the end of the world, the destruction of man. I don't know why, maybe it was a Christian movie I saw, but that term apocalypse carried this really negative, destructive tone to it. Until I looked up what the word apocalypse really means, and it really means appearing, coming, Lighten, manifestation, revelation be revealed, lifting of the veil. And I realized apocalypse isn't so much about the destruction of the world. It's about the destruction of our old belief systems. The revealing of who God really is. The revealing of who we really are. You know, the question God is always asking me is, how do you define yourself? Who do you mainly associate yourself as? Are you associating yourself with your old dead man? Or do you mostly associate yourself as the resurrected new creation in Christ? You know, sometimes I'll start praying and God will say, that's not the resurrected you speaking. That's your old dead man speaking. I'm not the God of the dead because scripture says that we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live and we can't keep dragging that person up before the throne. He wants 
you. We connect spirit to spirit with him. So 2 Peter 1.4, I just want to give some scriptures about who we are in Christ. Because sometimes when you take scriptures and you put them all together, it's a little more clear and, and powerful. So John 17, 22 first. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. You know, a lot of people are afraid of the glory. It's like, don't steal God's glory. Well, don't steal it, but at least take what is given. <laughs> You know, I used to have this thing, well, I don't want to do anything too miraculous because I don't want to steal God's glory. And then God said, Wendy, you can be as glorious as you want. And I'm like, what? That sounds sacrilegious. And he said, no, don't worry, you'll never come close. <laughs> <laughs> and it dawned on me, oh, the only people worried about stealing God's glory are the ones who don't know how glorious he is. We think healing the sick is glorious. In his economy, that's taking the garbage out. Those are the little things that he's asked us to do. It's not being presumptuous to take the garbage out. We just have such a low view of who we are and that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and therefore there should be things that now seem really glorious but if we are have our eyes on God and he is the the main focus then what we're doing is nothing compared to him second Peter 1 4 by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Are we living that? Is that just a theology? Or do you actually believe that you're a partaker of something divine because he lives in you? I like to tell people Jesus doesn't live in you because he needs a place to live. You know, demons... The reason they indwell in people is because they want to manifest through them. They want to create chaos, destruction, kill. The reason Jesus lives in you is because he wants to manifest in you. Bring life, hope, healing. Destroy the works of the enemy. And yet we're afraid. We're afraid to become everything he's created us to be. And he's calling for his church to step into who they are. You know, the whole earth is groaning for the revealing of the sons of God. Yes. Because the earth has been put under the curse and it's the sons of God that are going to release it. But we can't do it without knowing what our authority is. You know, I used to think that... Um, here's one more rabbit trail. I, um, I used to think that God made Adam and Eve, put man on the earth, and then he sent Satan to torment and test us and see what we're made out of. Until one day I realized that Satan had been cast out of heaven long before we were created. And he was put on the earth. And then God created man to torment Satan. <laughs> yeah. We've had it all wrong. And that was as a human being. Now we're a whole new creation who are divine partakers. authority. I mean, God actually said, go and take dominion. What are we waiting for? Perfection? Because that's not going to happen. <laughs> Colossians 3.1 If 
then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. I could go so many places with this, but the, the big thing is, seek those things which are above where Christ is. We tend to think as Christians, oh, you know, that means we need to, to just seek good character and everybody, you know, be in order. Um, but when it says set your mind on things above, it actually means that to establish on earth as it is in heaven, we have to know what's in heaven. We have to know. We have to be able to see. And I, I meet so many people who say, well, I don't really see in the Spirit, and I don't hear God. I'm like, yes, you do. You just don't know it. Did you know that um, sight is a fruit of salvation? You must be born again to see the kingdom. Well, the kingdom, that's not talking about going to heaven. That's talking about, because you've already been translated into the kingdom. So sight is actually a fruit of salvation. But we don't believe that. Or we think, well, there's something uniquely wrong with me. But once we get out of that, that method of just, I'm, you know, if I become perfect enough, if I perform well enough, God will then zap me, and I will be able to walk in the supernatural. And we have it all wrong. We have to be transformed through knowledge, which is the Word of God. We have to allow the Word to change our view. You know, God actually told me, He said, Wendy, you can get your identity from your experience or the Word of God. Which is it going to be? Are you going to continue to go with, you know, the past determining your future? You know, for some reason, we tend to challenge the Word of God with our experience. Well, that can't be true because this happened. But we're not supposed to challenge the Word of God with our experience. We're supposed to challenge our experience with the Word of God. This may have happened, but this is wrong. Nothing happened when I prayed. That is weird. We need to believe that. Because this is who I am. I'm a supernatural being, a partaker of the divine nature. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. <coughs> and that's Hebrews 3.14. And the word partaker means partner, sharer, associate, and companion. John 17, 18, Jesus is talking to the Father in a prayer, and he says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And if you want to know how he sent Jesus, it's the first time that he was speaking to um, in, in the synagogue, and he read a passage out of the Old Testament, Isaiah 61. And that is what started his ministry. <laughs> and so if you go to Isaiah 61, you will find out how the Father sent Jesus. I have anointed you to preach good news to the poor. To release captives, to proclaim liberty, to bring the oil of joy for gladness. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That is what you're anointed to do. He never sends you out to do something that you're not qualified for. 
You know, we don't, when babies are born, we don't teach them how to be human. They're already human. We just teach them how to work out their humanness. We teach them how to do what they were born to do. When we get born again of the Spirit, it's not about becoming spiritual, it's about learning what this new creation as Spirit is. John 3, 6, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. We're all born of the Spirit, but most of us are pretending the Spirit realm doesn't exist. Where do you think the Kingdom of Light is? It's in us. And we need to begin to release it. John 11, 40 says, Did I not say, if you believe, you will see? He's talking to Martha there. They're on their way to release Lazarus from the grave. And Jesus says, did I not say, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? How many people here have been crying out to see the glory of God? I have a theory about the glory of God. Because when, you know, remember when Moses was hid in the rock? He had been saying, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. God hides him in the rock. And gold dust and feathers didn't, you know, fly by. God declared his goodness and his everlasting faithfulness. And that's how it describes the glory. And I was reading that one day and I thought, oh, that's why we're not seeing the glory is because we can't really embrace how good God is. And they're tangled up together. What if he's even more good than you thought? What if he loved you just the way you are? What if he believed in you more than you thought? What if he was so good that he wanted to exchange your heaviness for praise, the oil of joy for mourning? What if we really believed all those things were possible? How much have we settled what we think a good Christian life looks like? Have we settled for just something a little tiny bit out of reach? If I just don't have any issues, I'll be happy. Right? When we were pastoring in Nevada, no, it was in Weaverville, California, my husband and I started a new group because we had opened up our church for self-help groups, you know, um, AA, other addiction programs, um, anger management programs. And my husband and I were thinking, how come all the programs out there are from, for getting us from crisis to average? Is that really the goal? So we started Mediocres Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. <laughs> because we wanted to get everybody totally uncomfortable with mediocrity. Amen. Why do we think mediocrity and survival is the goal? When scripture is very clear that he came to give this some kind of life that is way above what anybody's ever seen or heard of before. Amen. Remember when he said, I came to give life and that life more abundantly, he's actually talking to people who are already alive. <clears throat> Which means his concept of life is different than our concept of life. creation. And this one I love. 
Luke 8, 10. And he said, to you, how many believe this is you? He doesn't, you know, qualify it. You who have been perfected or you who have reached a certain level of, you know, character. He just says, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We keep downgrading that to, you know, just maybe being saved. There's so much invitation into the kingdom. And Ephesians 2 even says that we are already seated in heavenly places with him. What are you going to do about it? Is that just information? Or, or are you contending to be able to experience being seated in heavenly places so that you can begin to take dominion on earth? A spirit knows no time or space. That's what God is. And when he awoke in our spirit, it, yes, it's in us, but it's not limited to us. It can be in many places. And I wish I had time to share some wild stories I've heard. I mean, just for example, I mean, I have actually heard quite a few stories of people who have had dreams. One guy actually dreamt that he was walking down the street in some city, met a guy, led him to the Lord, and he woke up and he thought, that was so real feeling. Until a few months later, he met the guy. And the guy goes, oh, wow, you're the guy who led me to the Lord. And he's like, I thought that was a dream. There's all kinds of stories like that. Here's another. This one will kind of, you can do with this scripture whatever you want, but I find it fascinating. John 10, 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In and out of what? I mean, once you're dead, you're not going to be going in and out. Maybe we're not finding pastures because we're not going in. And you put that with um, Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. I used to think that was about death and going to heaven. He says, you neither go in yourselves, which means they're, they're still alive, so they haven't died and not gone in. It's that same in and out thing. The kingdom of heaven. It's a spiritual place in your spirit. And we're supposed to be carrying it. What would happen if we really believed we were carrying the kingdom of heaven within us and that it was beginning to influence the world around us and that we no longer set the same limitations that we used to set on our life? What if we believed something different? What if we were like the intern I shared at the beginning? His name is Levi. What if, instead of just deciding, I'm not built for that, I don't have the right personality to go in the spirit and be in the spirit, what if we just decided that this is who I am? That I'm a whole new creation that I want to see the revealing of who I am in Christ to the fullness of what was intended. 
I mean, obviously, Scripture says that kings and ki kings and queens will come to our rising. If there aren't any kings and queens coming to you, you have not risen. That's not for condemnation. They're not coming to me either. <laughs> But at least I know I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey to not settle. God didn't die so you could just have a mediocre life. And he didn't die so you could be a great human being. He died to create a whole new race. First John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. Not as he was on earth, but as he is, resurrected Jesus in heaven, as he is, so are we, what, when we die? No, in this world. This is what makes us overcomers. Being something, coming into agreement with who we really are. John 10, 1 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Again, this can't be referring to people, you know, crawling into heaven, not, and not coming through the door of Jesus. If you look at it logically, it's implying that there is a way into the unseen realm and the spirit realm that is not legal, which is New Age, a bunch of other stuff. They are entering the spirit realm, pulling, they're, they're stealing. That's why we have psychics. They actually can tell people's future because they are illegally going in and stealing the gifts that were created for those who are born of the Spirit and come through the gate of Jesus Christ. And Satan had a really good plan. I can't keep them from getting saved, but I can keep them out of the Spirit realm by making them afraid of it. They will never gain authority over me when they still think they're just human. <clears throat> so the main thing I really wanted to get to today is Understanding that we're not supposed to get our life from responding to outside stimuli. Uh, if somebody would just tell me that I was good at this, then I would really believe I'm good at this. If someone would just try to convince me that I'm valuable, then I will be, I'll believe I'm valuable. How often are we trying to determine our identity from what's going on out there? Somebody rejected me out there. I must not be valuable or worthy. We use outside stimuli to determine our value and our identity, and it's just plain wrong. What if we began to get our identity, our value, our, that, that sense of being from within. And that, that happens when we begin to actually try to concentrate on feeling, okay, right now all I'm sensing is my old life, my old, you know, crummy self, but by faith, I'm born again. I'm a whole new creation. Where is that in me? 
I need to allow it to rise up. I need to get an association with it. You know, just like we, we associate events in our past that keep the ball rolling for the identity we have of being unlovable, shameful, um, guilty, whatever it is, we keep that in our head as, as that marker of who we are. But we're supposed to take the salvation, the presence of God, and we're supposed to actually connect with it and identify it as me. This is me. I'm one with the presence of God. I'm a partaker of Christ. Can we find our being within? It's a spirit of, of peace, of nobleness, of strength. And the more you sit in that place, identifying, imagining yourself as who God says you are, the stronger the sense of self comes from the inside, and then you get to live it on the outside. I really believe that when Jesus used to go off by himself to pray, I don't think it was, you know, to do a list of prayers. I think he was there to remind himself who he was, get that connection with the Father, so that he wouldn't get stuck in identifying himself as a mere man, but a man who is in close relationship with the Father, to remind himself that he left glory for this place and who I am. I mean, just the very fact that he said, you know, I, I could call a, a legion of angels to deliver me if I wanted, because that's who we thought he was. I remember once, when we first started um, pastoring, I felt so inadequate, and um, we, 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 we were getting people saved in the church, but so often they would just, you know, end up just sitting in the back pew doing nothing, or they would just stop coming, and the father said, Wendy, you're not very good at making disciples. And I'm like, I know. I don't know what the issue is. And he said, well, your problem is, is you're trying to get people to act like Jesus instead of believe like Jesus. And when you're just trying to act like Jesus, it's called acting. And the people are getting tired of acting. They're tired of trying to look like Jesus when they don't believe they're a partaker of Jesus. He said, if you can get them to believe like Jesus, how did Jesus believe? He believed that he had all authority. He believed that he was in perfect right relationship with the Father. He believed he was loved by the Father. Highly favored of grace and power. He believed he was greater than sickness and death. What if we believed that? <coughs> For instance, if I had two handkerchiefs up here, and one of them, I told you, someone with a really infectious disease has been coughing and sneezing into this thing for the last three days. And this other handkerchief in my hand has been in the presence of prayer warriors in the prayer chapel for three days. Which handkerchief would you have the most faith in? Would you be afraid to rub this handkerchief in your face? Can I tell you, the average person has never seen a germ. And yet, you believe this handkerchief that you do not see a spot on. You believe in germs. You believe in the ability of those germs to infect your body and make you sick. Remember Acts 19, when they were taking the handkerchiefs and aprons off of the disciples, and 
people would instantly get healed and delivered? The unseen realm is just as real as a germ. More real. What if we had even more faith in this handkerchief? What if we started spending time in God's presence pretending to be handkerchiefs? I mean, that's all it takes. God told me it's not that hard to be anointed. Even a handkerchief can do it. <laughs> and yet we're so stuck in performance. We're so stuck in our old life that we haven't embraced our new life. We haven't embraced the fact that when it says, come boldly to the throne of God for whatever you need in your, in your time of need, we don't believe that we can go actually to the throne room of God, spirit to spirit with him. Sit in his presence, soak it up. If you can't think of anything to do in prayer, then just act like a hanky. And by faith, just, you know, God, I'm just here because I, I, I want you to fill me. I just want to be near your anointing. I want to just soak up your light and your love and your grace. I want to soak up everything you are. I want to be a partaker. I want to partake at such a level that people accidentally get saved and people accidentally get healed when I walk by. John 10.10 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He doesn't say, I've come to threaten you into line, or I've come to exhaust you with a long list of demands, or it's not even, I have come primarily to forgive you. Forgive you was just a means to the goal, which was life. Fullness of life. <laughs> I'm so unsatisfied with where I'm at. We need, we need people who are willing to explore who we're supposed to be. Go after it. Go, you know, seek those things. Just close your eyes for a moment. Holy Spirit, I just ask for an apocalypse in this realm. Revelation, the spirit of revelation to begin to just spark in everyone here. Let the fullness of Christ begin to rise up within you. To have a connection. And if you have to go back to the first day you got saved, or the last time you had a great encounter with Jesus, or a great worship time, go back to that where you really felt more spirit than flesh. And let it just rise up within you as identity. Begin to say, that's me. Let bravery rise up. Let righteousness arise. Allow the sense of your new righteous DNA to arise in you. Let the new birth come forth. Allow peace and strength to arise. This is who you are. You're a partaker. Let creativity arise. The God who created the universe is in you. Let his creativity arise. You can do all things. And 
and let light and life just feel it settle in your very being. Let it affect your cells, your DNA. Allow the supernatural, a spirit infused with God's spirit, lives in you. Connect with it. Make it your identity so that you can never be satisfied with anything less. Just as an exercise, try to picture in your mind some event that you're going to be doing later today or later this week. And picture yourself in this new identity, empowered by the Holy Spirit, a carrier of light and life. Picture yourself going into things that you're going to be doing this week into any event, anything that has intimidated you, anything that you think can never be changed. What if you walked into that situation as a new creation, carrying the presence? how much more faith we tend to have in the realm of darkness than the realm of light. When our kids were small, we were, you know, we wouldn't let them watch certain TV shows because something might get on them. We stayed away from certain places because of the spirit of darkness, you know. We thought it, it might affect us. Why do we have so much more faith in the power of darkness to affect us and not the power of light? I have felt darkness. How many of us have been in a place and it was like, oh, there's such a heaviness here. It's even affecting my emotions. Or I thought I was really spiritual because I could, you know, pick up a spirit of perversion, you know, oh, wow, I feel slimed. And, you know, I sense things in the spirit. Well, if we can sense negative things, then why can't unsaved people sense light? I am looking to the day when I walk by an adult bookstore and somebody come out says, oh, did you did you feel that spirit of purity? What was that? It's time we actually put faith in what we carry. If somebody who's really tense and uptight can affect your emotions, then why can't your spirit of peace affect theirs? Because last I heard, light was more powerful than darkness. I'll tell you why. We don't have as much faith in light as we do darkness. We do here, but not in our heart of hearts. Let's be pioneers. Let's see the revealing of the sons and daughters of God as they were really created to be. Let's stop going for mediocrity and let's go for a rising and shining. Let's be unsatisfied with trying to reveal a glorious Christ. The world doesn't want a glorious Christ. They want someone who actually is shifting atmospheres and has the power to deliver. I don't want a theology of deliverance. I want the power of deliverance.
journey is fun. You know? It, it's just that we tend to make it not fun. I was sharing with the ladies this weekend that when our oldest grandson was learning to walk, I had the thought, why aren't babies totally depressed? You know, because they lived with us for about six months during that season. And he would wake up every morning just like full of, what are we going to do today? And I hated to tell him, you're going to do a lot of failing today. <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking they should be depressed with how much they fail every single day. You know, they try to talk, they can't. They try to walk and crawl, they can't. They try to eat, and that's a big mess. <laughs> you know, if I failed in one year as much as a baby failed in their first year of life, I'd be hiding under the bed. I would have such low self-esteem. But they're not. They're totally not depressed. And so I, I'm talking to God about it, and he said, the reason they're not depressed, Wendy, is because they're so convinced that they can do what their parents do, that failure doesn't move them. They're not looking at their performance to determine what they can do. They're looking at their dad and mom. But yet we, as adults, we're looking at our performance to determine what we can do when we're supposed to be looking at our daddy to determine what we can do. <laughs> I just realized I got really heavy and... <laughs> They have fun on the journey. They're okay. I'm not doing it. You know, they're not even afraid of embarrassing their parents. <laughs> <laughs> we need that childlikeness. You know, not once when our kids were learning to walk did we just say, well, you know, let's not take them out. Because that would be really embarrassing if someone saw they were trying to walk and I can't. And not once, when they fell down, did we start doubting whether they would ever walk. I'm not sure this one's ever going to make it. <laughs> what if we lived life like that? Can we get excited? Do you know that's why when you first get saved, you're excited? Is because you see a whole new world opening up. We need to go back to that first love, that first excitement. Of, oh. Do you know why people become witches? Because deep inside, they know they were created for something more than just being a human being. The reason we get excited when we get saved is something deep is calling unto us. Our true identity is like, oh, oh, I didn't have words for it, but I did kind of think that I was more than what I thought I was. So can I just pray over you all as we close? Father, I thank you for your goodness and your joy and your anointing that the journey of the Christian life is all about learning how to live that resurrected life. God, I just ask that everyone here would just begin to have dreams and visions and, and ideas and creativity of what they're called to be and do and that every limitation that they have placed on their life would be broken in Jesus' name and that they would arise and shine to their true reality, their true identity, that they would associate themselves more with their new birth than their old past dead self. And Father, that their lives would become alive and full of joy and overcoming, and that they would begin to take dominion over darkness and to begin to break the back of the enemy, not from be below, but from above, seated in heavenly places, instilling the authority of Christ into every situation, releasing the angelic and, and demolishing the demonic. And we will give you all the glory. 
And we thank you that you have given us this whole new life. May we not squander it in mediocrity, but arise to your call. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Wendy, for just delivering this weekend and really pouring into the people. You know, we just saw the Lord um, moving in so many ways. We're so excited. Aaron Poole is going to be coming and ministering with the youth. Uh, Rachel is going to be joining him in December. We have some things that are coming of people carrying gifts of really believing God to work the miraculous. I believe that what she shared with us today is for us to understand that we are called to step into demonstrating Jesus Christ in this world. And so as we are here today, let's all stand up together again. I know you had to sit down to prepare to give. But um, let's bow our heads for a moment. I just want to take this opportunity just very quickly before I dismiss this all. That if you're here today, understand that God, the benefit of coming to Jesus is that he opens up heaven to us. But he really came to save us so that we might understand we're here to demonstrate what Jesus looks like and to reveal God in the world. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. Before I dismiss everyone, is there anyone here you've never met Jesus as your Savior? He came and he died for our sins. He rose again so that he proved to us that he's the victor. And before we go, I just want to give an opportunity for you to ask yourself this question. Have I come to Jesus Christ to have my sins washed away? Have I entered into God's plan for my life? And if you need the Lord today, would you lift up your hand? I just want to pray with you when I pray with a closing blessing. Is there anyone here that you've never met Jesus as your Savior? I want to give you a chance to respond to him. Father, thank you, Lord, for the revelation of who we are in Christ. I believe, Lord, that you've called us to change the world, to make a difference. The Spirit of God is inside your church. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for everyone to receive the word of the Lord today. Let it come alive to our hearts. Let us walk in the power and the demonstration of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today. Bless Wendy, Father. Bless her journey back. Bless, Lord, that seal the, the word that was released into the heart of the people all weekend long. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name that everybody said, Amen. Amen. There will be prayer here in the front. If you need prayer before you leave today, our elders and their wives will be here. God bless you all. If you'd like to stay and worship for a while, you can. If you need prayer, come on up here. Let's show Wendy our appreciation again. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon.